I finally got my hands on the 35mm f1.4 Sigma art lens for the Sony E-mount, and I can't wait to tell you about it. Let's get undone. What is happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone and today I finally got my hands on two lenses that I've been waiting for ever since they were announced. The first is the re-release of Sigma's classic 70mm macro 2.8 and the other is the 35mm that I was talking about how excited I was in the previous video that I made on the new Sigma lenses that were coming out. I love the 35mm focal length. In fact, I'm shooting this video on a 35mm equivalent on my GH5 right now. So I was super pumped to find out that the 35 from Sigma came in because I haven't really been that excited about the value propositions from the 35mm lenses that are in the current lineup of native Sony lenses. So let's do a super quick unboxing and then I will tell you the results of some of the tests I already did on this lens and and we'll do some tests that I know that you guys want me to do because you mentioned them in the last video. Let's go do that now. I want to take a quick second to thank Camera Canada for supplying me with this lens. They knew that I was eager to get my hands on one of these, so they put one aside for me even though they are in high demand. But that being said, this is not a sponsored video. I paid full price for this lens, and I'm happy to report that it not only reaches my expectations, but surpasses them. Okay, so first up, let's talk about the decentering issue right away. The closest lens that I think compares to this one is the Distagon, the Sony 35mm f1.4 Zeiss coated Distagon lens that uh, has a bit of a unicorn status because it is an excellent, excellent lens but has big issues with quality variants that uh, you don't always get a good one. You don't often get a good one, but when you do get a good one, the, the people who have them be like, But everybody else seems to suffer from a strong decentering problem. Now the Distagon is great. It has really good weather sealing. It has a really cool aperture ring that you can de-click so you can use it for video and it's really smooth and fun to play with. And it has really, really great rendering and image quality. But it's $1,600 US or $2,200 Canadian for a lens that will likely give you quality control issues unless you're very lucky. I've gone through three personally and I have still not found a good one. Now I have noticed a little bit of the same problem with the Sigma, but I'm happy to report that that it is nowhere near as severe as the Distagons that I've tested. The right side of the frame does appear to be a little bit softer than the left side of the frame, just like with the Distagon, although not as noticeable. And even the Distagon wasn't really that noticeable unless you were taking pictures of, of things that had a uh, solid pattern background, you know, like a brick wall, or even if you got up close with the pegboard that I have in the background. But if you were doing something where there's like a center weighted object, you're not really gonna notice the decentering that badly. So a lot of people are still happy with the Distagon, even though it has a decentering problem, but people who were doing you know background based shots were noticing that it was getting softer off to the edges which I guess can be annoying if you pay that much for a premium lens but if your main question about the Sigma was going to be does it fix the decentering problem that the Distagon has the answer is yeah, pretty much mostly but but not completely while we're on the topic of the Distagon I want to make a quick note about the size and weight comparisons the Distagon is a little bit longer but the Sigma is a little bit thicker and the Sigma weighs about 30 grams more I mean it, they're pretty negligible differences at the end of the day it's going to have the same kind of impact on your arm and I think if you had your eyes closed, you'd be like, yeah, they're about the same. The Sigma does have a focusing distance window that the Distagon does not, but the Distagon has that aperture ring that the Sigma does not. They both have the same aperture range though from f1.4 to f16, but the filter diameter is a little bit smaller on the Sigma at 67 millimeters to the Distagon's 72 millimeters. So they're very similar and optically they're both great and really sharp with the art lenses being known for being really contrasty and sharp, but the big difference comes in at the price, with the Sigma being almost half the price at about $900 US or $1,200 Canadian. Now there's two other lenses worth mentioning in this 35mm roundup for sort of what's available there natively on the Sony right now. You've got the uh, the Sonar, the 35mm Sony Zeiss f2.8, which is a really capable little lens and, it, and it's great, but uh, I mean it's a full two stops slower than the two lenses we've mentioned already, so it's not really in the same ballpark. 
Uh, and, but price-wise, it's actually quite close to the Sigma. It's $800 US or $1,000 Canadian. So, I mean, you would look at that and you'd say, I don't really think I'm getting the same value that I am getting out of the Sigma. But there is something to be said about the fact that the Sonar is very light and compact and would probably make for a really great sort of like travel lens. And then lastly, you've got the Samyang or Rokinon 35mm f1.4, which, you know, visually looks very similar to the Distagon. And if you remember in my previous video where I talked about Samyang and Rokinon, if you haven't seen that video, check that out. I mentioned this lens and I kind of talk about th these companies. If you don't know much about these third party providers, it'd be worth you checking out. But basically you have to be careful when you buy lenses from Rokinon because their build quality and construction and the parts of the use or the, the materials they use is a little bit lower grade. So, you know, that might affect the longevity of the lens. And there's also been some issues. And if you read the reviews of people who have some performance consistency problems. So, but it, but it's a great price. It's $580 US or $900 Canadian. But there's definitely some arguments to be made about you get what you pay for in that really low sort of price bracket. And something else to be aware of is that for many suppliers, the Rokinons are considered special order, so you may not be able to return them. But if you get one that works great for you, then, I mean, that's the best value that you possibly could get. Which brings us around to the Sigma again, which if you can combine sort of the pros of the more expensive lenses without getting any of the cons of the cheaper lenses, then you kind of have the ultimate lens, right? Well, I think so, and that's why I was so excited about it. Now, in the video I did earlier on the 50 millimeter lens, you guys said that you wanted to know more about the video focusing performance, so let's jump into the focusing stuff now. Now, with regard to the photo focusing, I wanted to test the consistency of the lens because one of the things that plagued the Sigmas in their earlier, you know, lifespan of the art lenses was that the focus would either be sort of just in front or just behind where you wanted it to be and that sometimes it wasn't consistently focusing on the same point that you were expecting it to. Now, this is something that Sigma's been getting better at year over year, but I figured I'd go ahead and test it anyway. So I did strings of 15 shots. So what I would do is I would focus on something, then focus away, then focus on the focus away, then focus on back and forth to the same spot 15 times and see how many of them had the same focus and also if the focus was correct right and then I would do it for people I would use the IAF so focus away then IAF then focus away then IAF and keep going like that and in the strings of 15 shots that I did in in almost each case 14 minimum of the 15 were in focus that's like 93% of exactly perfect what you want to be. So like in the IAF, when I'd zoom in, the eye was like perfect. Now in the one shot that wasn't perfect, it was still usable. It's just that you'd be like, oh, it's kind of, kind of hit the eyelash. Remember a little bit too much on the eyebrow. Now for me, this percentage is very acceptable when you take into account how fast I was actually conducting the test. I was essentially just like focused, 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 foc and each time pressing the shutter. And and it was on like so, so much, like I said, like 93% of the time from just that instant. If you, if I am sure that if I had an extra second to like, you know, really line it up well, it would be probably perfect all the time. But 93% uh, with that fast is, I mean, for what I use it for, I'm incredibly pleased with that. And I'm sure some of it has to do with the fact that I'm shooting this on an a7 III, which is incredible, but I, I definitely think the lens played a big part in that. Now, lastly, as I was saying in the previous video, you guys wanted to know a little bit more about the video focusing. So let's go ahead and set up a test for that now. But I'll just take a quick peek here and see what my video focusing settings are so that you guys are aware of that. So for video autofocus, I have the AF drive speed set to normal, which is the medium option between slow, normal, and fast. And the AF tracking sensitivity I have set to standard when there's responsive another level above that. I've been finding that normal and standard is, is pretty quick for what I like. You know, it's kind of a smooth transition. I'm sure that you could ramp these things up if you wanted something a little bit more responsive, a little bit faster, but of course it'll be a little bit jitterier, but that's, that's up to your personal taste. But let's have a look and see how it performs. Okay, so I have the Sony set up over here and I have it set to autofocus continuous and I have the focusing mode on the expanded flexible spots. So that's the square and the, with the like little squares around it. And uh, I'm just gonna look over here and I'm gonna hold up an object and back to my face and then back to the object and back to my face and one more time for good measure and back. Now, obviously, like I said, you can set this a little bit faster or more responsive if you want. I have it kind of in the medium settings because I like a little bit of a slower transition when I use it practically. Obviously, I don't just hold things up and then put them back down when I'm trying to shoot something for real. So if you're actually trying to use the autofocus continuous for real purpose, you'd probably want it to be a little bit smoother, but there are faster settings if you want it that way. So for a little bit of a tracking test, I'm just gonna do a little bit of like getting closer to the camera and getting further away from the camera to see how it keeps up with me 
Let's do this a couple times. And then we'll give it a moving object and see how it performs that way. So that's pretty much it. Basically, it's an art lens adapted natively for Sony E. So it's hefty, but it performs brilliantly optically and, and focus performance is really, really great too. And it's only $900 US or $1,200 Canadian. So that makes it a pretty excellent value and probably the best bang for the buck 35 millimeter available for Sony E right now, unless you want to take a chance on one of the Rokinon lenses. I had the Distagon until yesterday and I had the Sonar before that. And to be honest, I don't see any reduced quality or performance sort of stepping down from the Distagon to the Sigma. Uh, I, I love the Distagon, but I think that this is basically the same thing, but with a reduced price tag and no aperture ring. I love that aperture ring on the Distagon, but I love this lens and I think it's probably the ultimate value lens for the Sony E in the 35 millimeter space available right now. Anyway, that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done.